And welcome back, and we'll begin uh, by grading our quiz. After you guys have prayed and have already taken this quiz, go ahead and pass your quizzes to the right. And let's go ahead and grade these together. And so the very first question is asked, you are to describe the beast that represents or represented Babylon. Uh, this was in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, the first was like a lion and that had eagle's wings. Okay, so uh, if they have just a lion with eagle's wings or, or a lion, that'll, that'll just find the second was represented as a bear on its side that had three, uh, three ribs in its mouth. Uh, any, just as long as they have a bear, that will work. And the fourth is a leopard, and that obviously pictured uh, the speed in which the Grecian Empire uh, under Alexander the Great conquered the world. It was a leopard, uh, and it had uh, on its back wings like a fowl, uh, of a fowl. Uh, the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. The fourth and final beast, it's, it doesn't give it a description as to what kind of animal it is. It just speaks of it being dreadful and terrible, and it's strong exceedingly, its teeth being like iron, and it devoured and it broke in pieces, and it stamped down the residue with its feet, and it was, it was diverse from all the other beasts, and it had uh, ten horns. So uh, I'll just take anything that deals with being dreadful, terrible, strong, um, having iron teeth, and uh, having ten horns. All right, with that, uh, your bonus question is how many horns were there after there were, there were some that were displaced? Uh, this is the Antichrist and his kingdom displacing three of those horns. So how many horns would there be? There would be eight. So, uh, you know, three minus seven plus one is eight. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, so moving on, we're going to go into our next quiz. And that, by the way, or not next quiz, but our next lesson, that will be your last quiz, I believe. And so there shouldn't be a quiz for next week and because uh, you need to be starting to study for your final. And that's what I'm going to cover at the end of our lesson today is to kind of go over with you the final. And I'll go over it with you again uh, uh, next week as well for our final lesson. So we're going into the prophets. So we got to go from Isaiah all the way down to Malachi. And so we're looking at God's prophetic messengers. For a thousand years of, of Israel's history, they were men and women who received and they delivered God's messages to the people of Israel. The office of the prophet. Moses was the first who held the office. Moses also warned that, there would, uh, that, that when the people plunged into idolatry and to sin, God would send forth his prophets to warn the people. They would be his messengers. And Moses spells out the criteria of a prophet. If just one thing they say does not come to pass, that they prophesied would come to pass, he is a false prophet and he is to be put to death. Uh, so that goes for, you think about uh, those who prophesy, you know, who would say, I'm a prophet, okay? If they said anything wrong that was an error or that was, um, and they spoke on God's behalf, um, that didn't come to pass, then they were to be stoned. So the names of the prophets. The prophet, uh, this was the primary term used in the Old Testament, but they were also called seers as well. Um, God uh, spoken on behalf of God. He is God's representative. Uh, the seer, this also was a, time that, or a term that was used during the time of the judges. Uh, he would speak, God would speak many times through dreams and visions, and so they were called seers. They were called a man of God and a servant of the Lord. Uh, the role of the prophet, there are two mediators. Uh, there's the priest who goes on behalf of the people to God, and the prophet is on, on behalf of God to the people. Uh, the, they were preachers of the, law, of, of the already revealed law. They directed uh, coming persons and events, and they were watchmen and guardians uh, of the theocracy. The land of the prophets, Israel, uh, had these as, the, as its prophet. Uh, Israel had Joel, Amos, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, there are other uh, um, lands that the prophets prophesied against, uh, the land of Edom, and so forth. In Leviticus chapter 26, Deuteronomy chapter 11, and, verses tw and chapter 28 as well, 
or the warnings and promises to Israel concerning their obedience versus their disobedience. It was the uh, the uh, the the blessings and the cursings of, of keeping the covenant. In conclusion, uh, concerning the prophets, there are sixteen prophetic books from God's prophets. God sent uh, uh, God sent hundreds, but we naturally focus on those whose messages were written down and were preserved. And with that, we're going to start with Obadiah. Obadiah will be our first prophet that we'll look at. Introduction into the book of Obadiah. He is, uh, and the author and date, the shortest of all the Old Testament books. His name means servant of the Lord. Suggests the date is 845 B.C. He is the earliest of all the written prophets, or prophets that were recorded, uh, Purpose of Obadiah, the message of Obadiah was directed towards the Edomites. Remember I said that there were certain prophets that were to Israel, but some of them also prophesied to the countries were, that were beside. And so he prophesied concerning the Edomites, which were the descendants of Esau, as you recall. God was holding them accountable for their hostility towards the nation of Israel. Special consideration is that this took place there during Jehoram's reign. Uh, a summary uh, there was a coming judgment to the nation of Edom, and there were two sins that were cited, its pride and its injury to Israel. Uh, because of its natural fortification, uh, you may have seen this uh, uh, in the movie, uh, Indiana Jones, remember that, that uh, in the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, they go into that, that building that was made into the side of a mountain face, it looks like. That was from the city of Petra. And that building, as you saw, was their bank. I mean, this was a... They were the Swiss of their day, uh, like the Swiss were in World War II. They were the bank of both sides. And uh, they uh, held the capital uh, of many uh, countries around them uh, for interest. Why? Because of its natural fortification. And if you've ever uh, uh, did, the, uh, did a study on... Uh, this, as you recall, the Spartans and their and their fight with three hundred men against the whole Persian army, where they went to that pass and their numbers didn't count for anything. Well, that's exactly what it was for the city of Petra. There was only enough room for maybe one person or, or two pick person wide kind of can go through, and that was it. And so that kind of mitigated any kind of great army that would try to assail it. Uh, and because of its natural fortifications. It became, uh, it being their capital, they were confident that they would never be destroyed. That was their pride. She would be, but she would be destroyed, not from the outside, but from within. Her allies would not come to support, and it predicted their destroyer, their destroyer being a friend. So what happened was that they invited this army into uh, Petra, and they, from the inside, rose up and killed. Uh, everybody, every person in that city. And uh, and so it spoke of how, in the book of Obadiah, how that that city would be destroyed and uh, how that it would, um, and how that, how that it would be a friend that would rise up against them, an ally that they trusted and thought that no harm would come to them by. <clears throat> then we move on to the book of Joel. Joel is the first to, to name the day of the Lord. And the introduction is, uh, his name means Jehovah is God. <clears throat> his prophecy was taken, uh, uh, recorded somewhere in the time of 830 B.C. Uh, Amos' prophecy took on the keynote of Joel's closing words. Uh, he, and then we look at the purpose of it. This was a message to the southern kingdom. Uh, special consideration, this was during the time of and the reign of Joash, Judah had survived the reign of the wicked queen Athaliah, as you recall. And Jehoiada, the high priest, took on uh, Joash as a son. And after Jehoiada's death, there was a loss, for, uh, a loss of intensity for God. And if you recall in that story, Joash, uh, after his, uh, basically his adopted father, uh, Jehoiada, the high priest, dies. It's not too long after that he kills his son, uh, Zechariah. And that's why I remember whenever Jesus said that the blood from uh, that the blood from 
uh, hey, was, yeah, it just happens this way, guys, sorry. But the blood from uh, the first of the prophets to die to Zechariah would, would fall upon that nation. And, uh, and it will come to me in just a moment uh, of who that first prophet was, and I'll, I'll, I'll spell it out later. All right, so we have the, the it's a message to the southern kingdom. Uh, the special consideration is the reign of Joash, uh, and this is, again, after Jehoiada's death and the loss of intensity towards God. All right, this is, again, uh, in the, the context of the book of Joel, it is the first mention of the day of the Lord. It means or speaks of a coming judgment. Now, you need to understand about prophecy is that prophecy can be, it's not just, it's not just necessarily talking about a one-time event. It can be something far and something near. By the way, the prophet was Abel, from the blood of Abel to Zechariah. So forgive me, I just came to me and I just forgot about it. So the first mention is the day of the Lord and a coming judgment. And then there's a near and a far aspect to many a prophecy. Or near and distant, and so whenever this is a prophecy, a lot. Of, have you ever heard the saying that uh, history repeats itself? Well, prophecy many times will repeat itself. So let me give you a case in point. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is very much described in Daniel's book, uh, and he is a type of Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to do much of the same things that Antiochus Epiphanes did. What did Antiochus Epiphanes do? He went and he, and he took a pig and he, and he desecrated the temple and he offered a sow on the altar. And, uh, indicate, and the Antichrist indica it's indicated that he will fulfill much of the same things. All right? and, and do much of the same thing. And it speaks about his end as well. And the same thing happened to, that will happen with the Antichrist as well. So this is a near and a far uh, aspect of the prophecy speaking about the day of the Lord. This was referring to the tribulation and the desolation of the locust plague. Now, there, uh, this was a, a uh, he's using a figure, a figurative way of it uh, also for a far prophecy, stating that there would be an army that would come against the land of Israel, and it would be similar to the plague of locusts, uh, as speaking of the day of the Lord. And uh, this... Uh, this, this happened during the time of Israel, uh, uh, in Israel, that there was a great locust um, plague that came across the land, and it ate everything that was green. It destroyed crops. It destroyed everything. Everything had become barren, and, uh, and there was a, uh, a drought that had come at the time of harvest, and thus had a, this had a great impact, and it, was no, and it was pointed out that this is the very finger of God, this discipline at the hand of God. And in the second half of the prophecy, it looks ahead to the future. Now, when the locusts, what they had destroyed, it would be similar to what the men who came across, who come across uh, against Israel would also accomplish and do. But Joel said that the land would be restored. And again, even though that we're looking at seven years of tribulation, uh, on the back side, we have, we have the millennial reign of Christ. And this is pictured here in how that the locusts, and how that there's great destruction, but there's a great promise on the back side of this, uh, of this calamity. And uh, Peter references Job. Uh, whenever the Holy Spirit came, and uh, he says this is that prophecy of Joel. And speaking about how that, the, that their young men would, see, would, would have dreams and so forth. And that the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out upon the people. And Joel 3, the focus is of the great end time battle and the final restoration by the Messiah. All right, this takes place. Uh, what, when does this all take place? What is this great swarm of people and bodies that, that come across the land that swallow it up? This happens in the, the Valley of Megiddo, uh, and it will also uh, entail the Valley of Jehoshaphat. You may recall this being the Battle of Armageddon. Or it could be the battle of Gog and Magog. Either one. Alright, so, uh, even though there is a distinction, by the way, between the battle of Gog and Magog uh, and Armageddon, I just want to make sure that that's understood. Then we have the book of Jonah. Jonah was, uh, he was a prophet to Nineveh. This happened during uh, Jeroboam II's reign in 780 B.C. The purpose was to reveal that God's desire uh, desired the salvation of, of Gentiles and extended his grace toward them. 
Uh, special consideration, God called Jonah to the city of Nineveh. Those brutal Assyrians, and let me tell you how brutal they were. When they conquered a city, they would skin the people alive, and they would put their skin on the ramparts, uh, the ramparts of the city wall. And so it was just, I mean, these were a brutal, brutal bunch of people. And for God to send a prophet, you know, like, and, a, and someone who had such great national pride like, uh, like Jonah, oh, it, it went to the very heart of him. And no wonder he wanted to go somewhere else. He didn't want to be killed by being filleted alive. And he certainly did not want God to grant mercy to, to a people that had not shown any mercy to his brethren and kindred. He was a patriot of Israel, and his reluctance to go was fueled by his hatred of the Assyrians and the fear that God might actually show them mercy. And so, uh, kind of leads you, gives you some things that led up to this time. There were plagues that had hit that city. There was an, a solar. There had also been a solar eclipse that had occurred, uh, pointing to signs of coming judgment. And then, and this caused them to be receptive to the message. Of Jonah. Uh, summary of the book is the nation of Israel uh, was responsible for being uh, being a light to the Gentiles, a responsibility that they had forgotten. And uh, this is this book is written by Jonah, and you kind of it kind of leaves you uh, hanging towards the end. Uh, it's like, did Jonah figure it out at the end? I think as an, I think that he wouldn't have recorded it. That way, if he hadn't have also figured it out, uh, the first chapter recorded John. Uh, it re records that Jonah hears God's command, but he refuses to go. He then flees. He seeks. Uh, he seeks a, seeks a ship that is going in the opposite direction. He's looking for a ship that will take him to Tarshish, and he gets on that boat and gets caught in a storm. They throw him overboard, and he's swallowed by a great fish. Chapter two is Jonah finding himself alive in the belly of the whale. And in finding grace for his stubbornness, uh, Jonah is then spit up on the shore after three days, and he's carry, he carries to the met, uh, he carries a message to Nineveh. Chapter three is the recommissioning of Jonah. He preaches judgment to the people of Nineveh, and the people re, uh, repent. Chapter four, uh, Jonah realizes his fears have been realized, and God would not destroy. The city, and you say, "Well, what was the message he carried?" And you know, uh, it's it's also interesting too. He only went a day's journey in. It took you; it would have taken you three days to go across the city on foot. And so he only went a day's journey in, and all he had was one message: forty days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. And the people humbled themselves, and the message was brought to the king, and they humbled themselves before God and sought uh, and and sought. Uh, forgiveness uh, and so mercy and God does not destroy them and Jonah gets angry about it in chapter 4. God graciously rebukes Jonah for his lack of regard and compassion for the people and uh, he even goes as low as saying and by the way there were many cattle down there too would you have me would you have me kill all those uh, all, all that cattle down there that you could have some really good steaks with that Jonah now, um, but Jonah, it seems like it, it leaves it on a, on a cliffhanger as, does he get it? Again, I think that Jonah does get it. But I think it leaves it on that cliffhanger so that Israel might get it. All right, the conclusion, again, uh, you got to understand the scripture. Scripture, we don't read it, it reads us. And that's, a, and that's what I think Jonah, uh, under the inspiration of God and, and recording that, uh, brings that question about. Now we go to the book of Amos. Amos was a country preacher, if there ever was one. He was a shepherd turned uh, prophet. Uh, he was a country boy. He was a farmer. And his, uh, his, his ministry began during the reign of Uzziah and Jeroboam II. And, and the considerations of this is that the northern kingdom had become very wealthy and very prosperous. They were still in their idolatrous worship of those golden calves that were set up by Jeroboam. Uh, and they were, they again, they had grown wealthy, but they had been morally lax. They're religious, they were re religiously indifferent. And Amos and Hosea were set, sent to stop Israel from their plunge into ruin 
And uh, Amos and Hosea are the last prophets to the northern kingdom, by the way. Summary of the book of Amos. Amos pronounces judgment on the six nations that are located around Israel because of the harm that they had caused to Israel. Um, there is uh, three transgressions, and yet four are emphasized in their multiplicity of their sin. It uses that, yea, three transgressions, yea, four. Uh, this is also used, um, if you recall, in, uh, in Proverbs as well. Uh, these six things the Lord doth hate, yea, seven are an abomination. Uh, this is to show the multiplicity uh, of the sin and how that their how um, how that their sin was ever increasing. Judah was also condemned in his message. Uh, Israel is addressed for her many sins and oppressions of the righteous in her borders. The second half of the message entails three discourses: uh, the charge uh, the charge against Israel, her sin is the cause for her coming judgment. The second discourse. Uh, describes her sin of uh, uh, being uh, being describes the sinful luxury of the nation and the worthlessness of her religious activity, because she had refused to repent. The sentence prepared uh, to meet uh, the, this was the sentence that was uh, pronounced over her. Uh, Amos chapter four verse twelve. He says, "Prepare to meet thy God." And the third discourse speaks of the devastation. And that only 10% of the people would be left in the land. Amos records five visions. The first two are that of, that lo of a locust plague and a devastating fire that were averted through the intercessions of the prophet. The third was that of a plumb line, revealing how far off the nation was from God's standard. The fourth was the basket of full ripe fruits that emphasized the imminency of judgment. Judgment could not be delayed. And then the smitten capitals, the smitten capitals, the striking of the false temple in Bethel collapsed. Uh, it collapsed on those in uh, collapsed on those on the inside. Our interesting, uh, interesting historical uh, portion of a confrontation between Amos and Amaziah, the priest of Israel's false religion of Bethel. Uh, again, he's a country preacher. And he just told it how it is. At one point, he calls Israel a bunch of fat cows. All right, this is kind of this is if there if you read it, read it from if you can an old country preacher type uh, voice, and you kind of see it come to life in this. He's just a farm boy. He's just a good old boy, and uh, he's a uh, he's turned prophet. Uh, Lord has commissioned him to speak to the nation, and I love this because he leaves. It, it's all divine. This is all divinely inspired. But he leaves the personality of that prophet intact, and he uh, and he allows for that uh, that expression uh, of that personal expression. Yet it be it's divinely inspired, as if man had nothing to do with it, and it's still man's uh, man's emotion and man's everything is still attached to it, as if God didn't write it. And the same thing goes when we understand the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's just as much God as if he had never been man. He was just as much man as if he'd never been God. Uh, that, that's the best way we can describe uh, those things. And so uh, Israel is finally assured that in the great day, the future day of the Lord, the Davidic dynasty would be restored and the, and the hope in the midst of an impending judgment. All right, moving on to Hosea. Hosea is the last prophet, and God uses this man in a mighty way. 750 B.C. is the date, and it was to illustrate uh, Israel's unfaithfulness to God as a final voice before judgment fell. Uh, considerations. Israel is referred to in this as Samaria and Ephraim on occasions. Hosea did not minister during pleasant times. Did not minister during ple pleasant times. After the death of Jeroboam II, only one king died of natural causes of the six. And the nation had descended to the state of the heathen nations that were before it. And this is a summary of it, is that God uses an extreme method for getting his point across to the hard-hearted people of Israel. He has the prophet, Hosea, marry a prostitute. He marries a woman by the name of Gomer, and they have many, they have children together, but then he discovers that she has been unfaithful to him, 
And some of the children that they had are not his. So the three children were given names that said something to the, to the effect of the people's relationship with God. Jezreel, it, it was a name that carried with it judgment. Judgment. Lorama. Uh, this is whenever he began to see that these children were not his. Lorama is a, is a daughter he has, and it means no pity. I will have no pity on the nation of Israel. And then Loami, he says, uh, he names the son Loami, not my people. You're not my people. But then if you notice, if you read, uh, read the book of Hosea, it transitions. Uh, it, it indicates that, again, the first was their child, but the other two were not his. Um, and then he has, and he, he commissions his children to go back to, his, to their mother and plead with her to come back to him. And uh, he changes the names. Lorama, not mine. He changes it to Rama, means mine. And then you see that he changes uh, Loami's name as well. And he changes it Ami, which means mine. Uh, so he changes Lorama to, uh, from no pity to Rama, which means mercy or pity. And Loami, not my people, my people. And if you see this, oh, it's a beautiful picture of the gospel because he has his children uh, go and intercede uh, that she might come back. And what were the what was the message that he was trying to convey to? Him? He says, "You're mine." Changes the name from "not mine" to "mine." You're mine. You belong to me. I will have mercy. But then I want you to notice one thing that did not change. He did not change the name of Jezreel. Was that because judgment would run its course if she were to neglect uh, the mercy and the pity that he had towards her? This indicated that uh, again, this going on, Gomer returns to her life of immorality. She continues headlong into her sexual uh, deviancy, and Hosea actually helps supports her wayward his wayward wife. He has pity upon her. He gives her food. He gives her. Uh, her oil, he gives her all these things, but she she attributed them to her lovers, and it's the same. He draws the same parallel with God. God had given them uh, crops, he'd given them uh, food, he'd been giving them blessings from the from the land, but they were attributing them to uh, to their idol worship, to that of Baal. And God had done so many wonderful things, and Gomer's good life came to an abrupt end when she found herself being auctioned off as a slave. There came a point. Hosea quit. He says, I will no longer give her her substance in her time of need. And he just let her go her wayward way. And then it came to a point that she was so spent that she was not worth anything. She was going to be sold as a slave to pay off debt. But not just that. By this time, she is aged. She is spent. She has a reputation. She's not worth anything. And here, he, she is on the auction block. And, he ha and God tells Hosea, I want you to go and buy her back. Now, he could have got her for hardly next to nothing. But I want you to see what's so beautiful in this passage. Is that he pays 15 shekels of silver and an omer and, ha and a half of barley. That is, that was 30 pieces of silver. That is, he paid full price for her. He did not have to. She was not worth that much. And let me tell you, if you don't see yourself in this, uh, in this depiction here... Uh, you are blind. This is what Jesus Christ did for us. We were not worth saving. There was nothing in us that was worthy of the sacrifice that he would give. And what did he do? He paid the full price for us. And, and in this we see the beautiful depiction of Hosea bringing her back to him. And he says, now you're going to do what I said. No, that's not the, way he, that's not the spirit in which he does this at all. He says, you will be with me and you will, you will be with me for many days. And, I, and you will not be for another. But I want you to catch what he says, nor will I be for anyone else. I'm going to be faithful to you. I want you to be faithful to me. And uh, he says, uh, God tells him, I will take the name of ba Baal out of her mouth. Baal meant master, Bali. He said, I'm going to, you will not call me Bali. Now, he could have, he could have, because she is his slave, he could say, you're going to be, you're my slave, I'm your master. You're going to get what's coming to you. That's not the way he did it at all. He says, you will not call me Bali, but you will call me Ishi, which means husband. And there, 
is a beautiful restoration that takes place there. And that's exactly what Christ's blood does for us. He redeemed us from our sin, but he, it, not only that, but He restores us. And uh, what a beautiful picture of God's salvation here. Uh, Hosea, again, he purchases her back for, back for himself at full price. He did not make her uh, his slave, but he reinstates her as his wife. And if you notice that, it's almost like a marital vow that takes place there. The second part of the book deals with the prophecies to this unfaithful nation. Again, this is a paralleling of what happened with Hosea and Gomer and what will happen with the nation of Israel. Uh, this was uh, this prophecy was dealing with an unfaithful nation like Gomer had been unfaithful to Hosea that they had received much from God but they had forsaken her husband they had forsaken her husband for other gods and the multitude of listed sins uh, Hosea lists unfaithfulness swearing deception murder stealing adultery rebellion idolatry disobedience pride stubbornness and spirit spiritism even though they had hardened themselves to the point where they would not repent. Judgment was sure, but Hosea affirms God's commitment to restoring Israel in the future. With that, we move on to um, a contemporary of Hosea, uh, Isaiah, which would, they would have ministered about relatively the same time. Uh, Hosea would have been a little bit before because Hosea ministers all the way up until Israel is taken into captivity, and now the Assyrian army is at Jerusalem's door, and we see the prophet Isaiah ministering to the crown. By the way, Isaiah was uh, uh, was uh, part of the royal court. He was uh, he was uh, he was a close of kin to the king, and so the author date he was a court preacher. He was a cousin to King Uzziah. His name means. The Lord saves. He was sawn in two by wicked King Manasseh, and he ministers uh, apparently he uh, about the time of 740 B.C. The purpose, like every prophet, he was raised to confront the nation concerning their sin, but he was also revealing the servant uh, of the Lord, which was Jesus Christ. And we also see the prophetic nature of his uh, the latter chapters, speaking about the millennial reign and the things that were going to be accomplished in that time. Isaiah was most notably. He most notably served under King Hezekiah, Judah's greatest king. Uh, speaking of a summary uh, of uh, Isaiah, Isaiah has been called the miniature Bible. It has 66 chapters, and with that 66 chapters, it has 66 books. Each one of those books, by the, or each one of those chapters, by the way, follow the theme of each one of the books of the Bible uh, as the theme of the canon, canon 66 books. There is a split between chapter 39 and chapter 40. Just like in your Bible, there's a split between the 39th book of Malachi and beginning in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and the 40th book. The first section deals with the prophecies dealing with judgment and history. The latter 27 uh, deal with the prophecies of peace, the, uh, uh, the sacrifice of the Messiah, Isaiah 53, that iconic chapter, all the chapters dealing with uh, his uh, millennial reign are very much in place here. His prophecies begin concerning the southern kingdom. Her sins were internal by nature. She had an outward sign, an outward showing of spirituality, but her heart was far from God. And it's this prophecy that Jesus uh, also quotes, uh, they draw near with me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's, uh, that's what Isaiah spoke about in the, the nation of Judah. Her sins were uh, it, her sins were again internal by the nature, but Isaiah he relates Judah to a vineyard that God had labored. He had provided uh, every means necessary for there to be a great harvest. Uh, but in spite of this labor, he is rewarded with very little fruit. Uh, uh, he ends up with wild olives and wild grapes and and or wild grapes and. Uh, he, he eventually says, I've had it, I'm done. And he tears down uh, his tower, he tears down the hedge, and he, and he just leaves it for the wild animals. And this is a powerful message of judgment, but also of a coming glory with many, uh, with many messages concerning, again, the Messiah and his coming kingdom, that he would be virgin born that he would be of the lineage and line of David, that he would be spirit-filled, he would rule the nations. 
uh, he, uh, his kingdom would be characterized by righteousness, peace, knowledge, uh, the lifting of the curse, and the removal of physical infirmities. Uh, chapters 13 through 35 is a condemnation to, again, surrounding nations. The historical aspect of Isaiah's prophecy uh, deals with the Assyrians invasion and the valor of King Hezekiah and how that God delivered Judah from the hand of the Assyrians without the, sh uh, without the shot of one arrow. God delivers at the very gate of Jerusalem and the angel of death comes in within the camp and they were all as dead men. And uh, we note the, the arrogancy of the Assyrian Empire and that wicked Sennacherib who, who, who said, it was God that, you know, uh, that called me against this nation to, to judge it. And then also he says, but what were the other gods of these other countries? And so what he, he was equating God to these other gods, which are not, which are not the same. And, uh, and he was saying that, uh, that they shouldn't listen to Hezekiah, that, uh, that God had delivered them into his hand. And what about the, and he says not only that, but he's taken away the, their altars. Uh, the false gods Hezekiah had removed from his kingdom. He was citing, and it's because of that I've come to judge, uh, uh, that their God has brought me to judge upon them. And again, God humbles the Assyrian Empire. And it, but from that point forward, by the way, it never would exert itself as a great world power. It, 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 that's when its power began to wane. And the Chaldeans' uh, power began to wax greater and greater. Hezekiah recovers from uh, also from a life-threatening illness, and shows. And the show, and then uh, the Chaldeans come, and he's uh, bearing a gift from that king, and he shows them all that all that he had. And Israel and Isaiah told him that they would come back, and that they would take everything that they saw, and this was fulfilled. 100 years later by King Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter, in the last 27 chapters, we deal with prophecies of peace. Uh, also notably, he calls out Cyrus by name uh, because of the uh, coming uh, invasion eventually by King Nebuchadnezzar uh, that they would be taken into exile within 100 years and uh, that 70 years later that they would be restored and it would be the, who would orchestrate that restoration. He's going to call him by name, King Cyrus. Way before he is born, 170 years before the fulfillment of this, he would restore them from their captivity. Prophecies concerning Jesus' first advent is that he would be the suffering servant. Uh, this passage was used in converting the Ethiopian um, eunuch who came, uh, as you recall, that Philip uh, led to the Lord uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, then he emphasizes also the Messianic kingdom and the new covenant. Let's look really quickly at the book of Micah. Micah. His name means, Who is like Jehovah? Uh, in 730, uh, 735 B.C. is uh, the approximate time. Uh, purpose was to call Judah back to righteousness. He denounced Judah's leadership for oppressing the poor. And he warned of con uh, coming judgment. Uh, considerations is that he spoke to the northern and southern kingdoms. It is no doubt... The Hezekiah was in, uh, influenced by this prophet. Uh, in this book, we also see that uh, that at the present time, is a, as, as Isaiah is in the south, Hosea is in the north, uh, he is ministering at the same time as these two prophets. His message is similar to that of Isaiah's, but he ministers to the common people. Uh, much like how uh, Ezekiel uh, in captivity ministered to the common people. Daniel ministers to the crown. Isaiah here ministers to the crown, but Micah during this time ministers to the common person, the common people. His first part is he declares judgment on Judah and Samaria. He declared that Samaria would be nothing more than a heap of stones. Assyria would be the aggressors, and Judah would escape this judgment. He bewailed that Judah laid on their beds imagining worse ways to sin. And the second part discusses both God as judge and one who keeps his covenant. Uh, this, this God who judges would come down on those false prophets, on the city, and even his own temple. 
uh, prophecies declared that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And uh, the last part of this book, Micah reminds the people of all that God had done for them and that he would uphold his covenant with Abraham. Also in this book as well, uh, you see Micah talking about the Assyrian who would come down. Now, uh, many put to that 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 is a picture of the coming Antichrist, that he would be an Assyrian of sorts. Uh, again, um, Nimrod, the land of Nimrod, uh, it was the Assyrian Empire, and Nimrod was the first picture of the Antichrist and his coming kingdom and his world power and how that he would demand to be worshipped. Let's go ahead and we will start. We got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of real estate to cover, and I want to go back over your final one last time uh, before we uh, before we're finished. So we're looking at the prophet Nahum. Nahum. Uh, the introduction Nahum means comforter. Uh, isn't it interesting? The Holy Spirit. He is also called a comforter. Uh, this is dated around 650 BC. Uh, the message of the book declares judgment on Nineveh, which came to pass in 612 B.C. Uh, Nahum illustrates Nineveh's destruction to being similar to that destruction of Thebes in Egypt, which took place in 661 B.C. The purpose of Nahum, to deliver a message of judgment on a nation that had previously responded to the revelation of God via Jonah. Uh, special considerations. Jonah is a hundred years removed. God has been merciful to the, to the nation of Assyria for a hundred years. Uh, and Assyria had brutally crushed the northern kingdom in 721 B.C. Uh, summary of the book. The first part of the book examines God as judge. But in the light of his character, uh, God is not, he does not rush to judgment. And in fact, he has said in this, in this book, it's to be he is slow to anger. Their sin was now done with knowledge because of the preaching of Jonah. They could no longer plead ignorance. Uh, they were deserving of judgment. And the second section deals with the carrying out of the judgment on Nineveh as described. God has pronounced that he is against Nineveh. And the third section uh, gives the reason for that judgment as being fair and deserving. It is uh, described as a wound that was incurable. Uh, Zephaniah is our next prophet and introduced as he is the great grandfather of King Hezekiah. His uh, relative would be that of Josiah. The purpose of this book was to assist a godly king, Josiah, in his attempt to bring Judah back to God. Uh, special considerations. Obviously, uh, Josiah is the last godly king of, of Judah. And he served during the revival of Josiah, but because of the wickedness of King Manasseh, their judgment was now irreversible, and the nation was going to be judged, but the focus was going, uh, goes uh, to the individuals to save themselves from coming, uh, coming events. Uh, the revival only delayed what was coming. Uh, summary is that there are seven, uh, there were seven times the phrase, uh, it's stated that the day of the Lord is stated. Now, the day of the Lord is imminent. It was a terror. It's described as a terror, a judgment for sin. Only a remnant would survive, and statements are both near and far as pertaining to this prophecy. So some of this will has yet not occurred, but will occur in similar fashion. The section deals with the coming judgment of Judah. But before this... He states that the whole earth will face the judgment of God. That is, we will all fall under the, of the beam of judgment. Uh, the ultimate fulfillment of this uh, will be the great and future day of the Lord. The, section, uh, the second section deals with the judgment of Philistia, uh, Moab, Ammon, uh, Ethiopia, and Assyria. Some of these will be allowed to return to their lands. Uh, the third section deals with the coming judgment on Judah. Her stubbornness and rebellion. Uh, the leaders were greedy, unholy, treacherous, and wicked. The fourth section deals with uh, a future time of, sal of salvation and blessing. This will find its fulfillment when the Messiah rule, Messiah's rule is established. Upon the death of Josiah, Babylon was knocking on the door just four years later. 
uh, Jeremiah. Uh, he was a priest. We're going to look at uh, Jeremiah the prophet. He's the last prophet of Judah as uh, before she goes off into captivity. Uh, Jeremiah was a priest. He ministered for 50 years. He spanned five kings, five administrations, and 40 years he was in Judah, and 10 years he spent in Egypt. The purpose, the message was directed to both the crown and the common. He was unpopular. His message was very unpopular, and his, uh, his message was that of irreversible judgment. You will go into judgment, but how severe that judgment is is still up to you. Uh, this is he is also known as the weeping prophet. Uh, certain consider considerations, like that of Noah. Uh, Noah uh, had no convert outside his own family. Jeremiah had no convert at all. He ministered during the three-way tug of war between Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, uh, with Judah caught in the mill, and that's what happened. If you recall, to King Josiah, he went out and met the king of uh, of uh, Egypt, who was on his way to fight that very famous battle against uh, Egypt and uh, Egypt and uh, I'm sorry, Egypt and Assyria were going to fight against the up and coming kingdom of Babylon. They had joined forces, but there they would meet their match by King Nebuchadnezzar. The first section deals with Jeremiah's call to ministry. He had been set aside since birth. God had purpose within him while he was still in the womb. Of what he was to do, God had called him to face a world of hostility, but that he would be protected. Now, let me just say this too: If God has a purpose for somebody while they're in the womb, before the before the womb, but yet we want to terminate the the life of a child uh, just prior to uh, the ministry that God would have them accomplish, uh, how can it be seen as anything less than murder? Second section deals with a series of eight messages given in the days of Josiah and Jehoiakim. The first recalls the former love of Israel for God and, um, and her present departure from him. The second view was that of Israel and Judah as being harlots, guilty of spiritual adultery. The third warned of Judah's hypocrisy and to, uh, and to not place faith in or place faith in the temple. They were so sure that the judgment of God would not come upon them uh, because of the temple. They would say, the temple, the temple, the temple. God will not destroy his own house. But the fourth dealt with the, his violent, uh, his violent, uh, was dealt with the violation of the covenant. The fifth, uh, fifth message dealt with Jeremiah uses a dirty belt. And he goes and he buries it and then he brings it back and shows after he had buried it for some time that it was good for nothing. It had rotted. It was no good and it symbolized their impending judgment and captivity. The six dealt with the drought, famine, and sword as being the measures of God's judgment. How he had allotted so many to be killed by famine, some by the sword, and other by pestilence. Uh, the seventh deals seventh message deal, deals with their great distress, but promises a great restoration. And the eighth takes place in the potter's house to illustrate God's sovereignty and uh, what's true for the nation, but it's also true for us as well. How that God has His way, uh, as a potter would have, in shaping and molding us into the people that we are today. That's why Paul says, "I am." Who I am, by the grace of God. And then uh, chapters 21 through 45 deal with the coming captivity. Uh, he also, in, this, uh, in, his script, uh, in his descriptions, he describes the coming siege. And he many times he would act out some of the judgments that would come, uh, come to pass. And, and uh, he preaches that personal judgment could be avoided if they submitted to the rule of the Babylonians. Again, not a popular message. It was seen as a dissenting voice, um, a treasonous voice. And that's why not too long after this message, he is, uh, he is viewed as a traitor, he's imprisoned, and uh, he is shamefully entreated. But uh, because, of Je uh, because Jeremiah's message 
was rejected. It received no audience, and everything was, uh, but everything was verified later. Jeremiah also preached of a time of coming rest and deliverance, uh, the wonderful messianic passages and the promise of a new covenant. Uh, this message was, um, he was, uh, uh, God had told him a near of kin while he was in prison, wanted him to redeem the land uh, from him. Basically, he was selling the land. And, and you got to understand in that if the stock market fell, you wouldn't want to buy uh, or was in the process of falling and failing, you wouldn't want to buy stock at that time because then it wouldn't be worth anything. Uh, here we have the Babylonians about to take over uh, and he, here is one of his relatives coming and selling him land uh, for him to redeem. And uh, But this, was the pro this is what God told him to do. I want you to buy it because the prospect is, is that there will be a restoration and uh, you will return to the land and redeem the land. Jesus spoke of his death, uh, uh, of his death bringing the new covenant. Uh, Gentiles would be able to partake in the new covenant. Uh, all this pictured in uh, Jeremiah's uh, sermons. The third uh, division deals with the surrounding nations and the judgment that would fall on them for their treatment of God's people. Uh, after Babylon, uh, Babylon came, many of them tried to escape, and what some of these countries were doing was rounding them up for the Babylonians and selling them some, and some of them selling them into slavery, um, and treating them very hostily. And God took notice of that and says, uh, "says because judgment fell on them, and you had no pity upon my people, so judgment will fall upon you, and I will have no pity upon you, and you will be sold into slavery." The final section deals with the historical section of the destruction of Jerusalem and their fleeing to Egypt. All right, moving on to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk uh, is actually a song. Uh, this uh, was written somewhere possibly 609 B.C., possibly not long after the death of Josiah. Uh, the purpose was, why does God allow bad things or evil to go unchallenged in the world? In chapter 1, this deals with the accusation and, and then and God's response. Chapter 2 deals with God tells him to write the vision, to make it plain, uh, so that he that runs with it shall be able to run with it. God tells him that no one is getting away with their sin. He is aware of it. And chapter 3 is the prayer and praise because he is overwhelmed concerning the judgment and the justice that God had pronounced. Alright, um, Daniel. Let's move on to the book of Daniel. We are now in exile and in captivity. 605 B.C. to 536 B.C. is the ministry of Daniel. Daniel is one of three men in scriptures where nothing evil was said about them. Um, we see that with Joseph and we see that with Jonathan. And he ministers to the court and to his captors. The purpose of this book, God's dealing with the king of Babylon and the Medo-Persian Empire. God's future dealings with world powers and Israel in the last days. Um, it's been said that you can, uh, that Daniel puts forth the skeleton outline of what, uh, what will befall in the last days. Everything from, uh, from uh, what starts the tribulation to to you know what occurs in the midst of the Daniel 70th week and uh, gives you all the parameters from which you drive all the other scripture to put in place uh, you know to flesh it out and so Daniel Daniel's prophecies uh, like I said gives the framework for all other Bible prophecies you cannot understand Bible prophecy without the book of Daniel the first section is the personal history of Daniel as he's being in cap uh, brought into captivity uh, the second section deals with his interactions with Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams concerning the future kingdom. The third section deals with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's refusal to worship the image that Neb King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Chapter 4 is written by King Nebuchadnezzar himself, showing his dream to Daniel, Daniel's interpretation, and the king's humbling experience. Uh, chapter 5 uh, deals with Belshazzar, handwriting on the wall, meeny, meeny, tinkle of phrasing. You have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been found wanting. And uh, 
let's just kind of stop right here. We're going to go back over those uh, five chapters real quick. Uh, Daniel, in the midst of captivity, it says that he purposed within his heart that he would not defile himself. Uh, that is a call to young men today. Uh, that it doesn't matter what context you find yourself in, that it's never a good idea to compromise on the Word of God or what He is, what He has for you. And it even gives you a respectful way. It gives you a roadmap for a respectful way in how you should conduct yourself. Um, the uh, uh, the interaction with Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams. Uh, the king was so rash, he knew the importance of the dream, but he didn't want there to be any defilement. He knew that the, the, the nature of it was divine, and he was looking for someone who could not only interpret the dream, but tell the dream itself. And no one ever asked that. And uh, again, he sees that image, and that's part of your final, is that he saw that image, the head of gold, the arm and uh Arms and shoulders of that of brass, uh, not brass, but uh, silver, and then the the uh, the thigh and the and the midsection that being of brass, the Grecian Empire, and the two legs of iron, uh, and then the feet of, of iron and clay, and then that rock of ages, hand, or that rock that was cut without hands. It smashes that image, but most notably, it smashes it on the feet. Why is that? Because that is the uh, that is the Antichrist's empire. His kingdom is crushed by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says that that rock grew into a great mountain. And it speaks of the millennial reign of Christ. And it's interesting because in the next chapter we see an image. That Nebuchadnezzar makes all of gold. And says uh, everyone wants to worship it. I, I have my suspicions here. That I think that it resembles the same image that he saw. But instead of saying, yes, there's going to be another kingdom come after mine, and then another one after that, he just made it all of gold, saying there will not be another kingdom. And in his pride and arrogance, he, he wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be worshipped. And that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship. And God uh, delivers them from the fiery furnace. And uh, not a hair of a hair was singed. Not, not even the smell of smoke was upon them. And then chapter 4 uh, he uh, he has that humbling experience where God humbles him to where he for seven years eats like a cow. Uh, his his uh, fingernails grow long. His hair gets unkept, and and uh, he is uh, he is greatly humbled. But apparently Belshazzar, his grandson, is not made aware of that same lesson, and it's under his. And it's under his administration that uh, that the Persian Empire comes and destroys them, and that's where the handwriting upon the wall, many many tinkle of phrasing, and uh, God takes and destroys the uh, the Babylonian Empire, and then Darius the Mede comes and he appoints Daniel again uh, as a uh, uh, as his right hand man. And uh, this is King Darius. Darius uh, uh, also makes hastily a law that says it's illegal to pray uh, to anyone but him concerning anything. And he's caught red-handed. And, uh, and he is thrown to the lines. Because the law of the Medes and the Persians doesn't change. It doesn't matter who it was that, uh, that offended in this matter. They had to be held accountable to the law. Even the king. And... Uh, God delivers him out of the out of that pit, out of that lion's den, and uh, and then we see then uh, in chapter seven the four beasts. This, by the way, mirrors Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember, he saw the four type uh, that image and the four pieces, the head of gold and so forth. But now we see a more detailed, oriented understanding of um, of these kingdoms, what characteristics that they would have. And uh, each one of these beasts portray the nature of that beast. And we also see in this the Antichrist, the ten horns, and the one that supplants the three, and speaking great things and blasphemous things. This is the Antichrist. Chapter 8 deals with the fall of Medes, uh, Medo-Persians, by the Grecian army. And uh, chapter 9... Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and... and Chapter 9 deals with uh, uh, Daniel comes across one of the scrolls of Jeremiah 
And in that scroll, it says that, Jeremiah says that it would be 70 years. Uh, 70 years, and they would be uh, brought back from the captivity. Well, Daniel goes in as a young man. Here he is an older man. And that time is fastly approaching, and he asks for the Lord to show him what is to happen on behalf of his people. And the temple in Jerusalem, and God responds with a revelation concerning 70 weeks that are determined for Israel. This shows that God's view of time, uh, by the way, is through the nation of Israel. Uh, we are in the middle between the 69th week and the 70th week. And you say, uh, and that's why many did not see this time of the Gentiles, this time of the church age uh, in prophecy, because again, God sees uh, time through his dealing, his working through the nation of Israel. So one week represented seven years, and uh, and there's seven years that still has yet to be fulfilled. This is the week that the Antichrist uh, will make a treaty. He will, in the midst of that week, break that treaty, and then at the end of those seven years will be the reign of the Messiah and Christ's second return. Chapters 10 through 12 deal with the final vision concerning the king of the north and the king of the south. Uh, again, a very almost like a, hi a history book depicting uh, all the things that were going to happen uh, concerning the Grecian Empire when it was divided into those four um, by those four generals. And, but there was two primary ones that you can take note of: the King of the North and the King of the South. And then it's eventually disrupted by the the King of Rome and uh, and its end. So this also in this too is uh, uh, the prophecy dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. And so Daniel again he ministers to the crown but now we look at Ezekiel who ministers to the common man who was in captivity. Ezekiel's mean, uh, Ezekiel's name means strengthened by God. He's taken into captivity in 597 BC. 570 BC is the date for the book. The purpose of this Daniel a minister to the crown Ezekiel ministers to the captives. The consideration is that chapters 1 through 24 were given before Jerusalem is destroyed in 586 B.C. And chapters 33 through 48 are messages of hope and consolation. The summary of this book is that uh, the first deals with the commissioning of Ezekiel with visions of the glory, majesty, and power of God. He is called to be a watchman to sound the alarm for the nation of Israel. And the second section deals with the judgment of Judah. Ezekiel then uses numerous visual aids, sometimes with no ability to speak. All spoke of coming judgment. He gives three messages explaining why the judgment is coming. Uh, he has given four visions of idolatry in Judah. Uh, women weeping for Tammuz. Now who is Tammuz? Tammuz was the son, supposedly, the, uh, the virgin-born son from Semiramis from, who was married to Nimrod. And this is, the, uh, this is the worship of Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. And this was discovered, uh, that he discovers in a secret place where the elders of Israel were worshiping uh, idols in secret. And then he sees the priests uh, facing the east, worshiping the sun. He sees the glory of God departing from the temple. Uh, sees how that it goes to the porch, and from the porch it goes to the Mount of Olives, and then it's taken up from the Mount of Olives. He is given four visions of idolatry, again, of Judah, but then, he's, uh, then he goes in, through and he, he speaks about Noah, Daniel, and Job. Even if they were standing before the Lord, it speaks of how inescapable uh, this judgment would be that these righteous people would bear, would bear, would only escape with their lives. Noah, Daniel, and Job. And so it's interesting that Daniel is named in this, uh, given uh, uh, as being as righteous as he is, and Noah, obviously, and Job as well, uh, being put in that same camp. Uh, the third division deals with the prophecies of judgment on Gentile nations, Ammon, uh, Moab, Edom, Philistia, uh, Egypt and Babylon. Uh, if you think that, that the prophets only minister to Israel, to the Jewish people, 
that's great. That's a that's gravely misunderstood because God ministered to the nations around them. Remember, the Jewish people were meant to be a light to the Gentiles, and uh, they still carried message and bore the message of God and the seed of the woman that was to come. Ezekiel has a future look concerning Israel. Israel would be restored politically and geographically, but there would be a spiritual restoration in the latter days. And that's the days in which we live. We see the nation of Israel. It has come together. It has been, uh, as, as uh, described in, the, in Ezekiel, uh, the, that valley of dry bones, all the parts have come back together, but they're still corpses. The spirit, the word uh, uh, wind or spirit are the same in the Hebrew language, the word ruach. And so the wind had not blown upon them, and they'd become, and they would stand upright, as you recall, an exceeding great army. But right now, they're still spiritually dead to, to the ways of God, to God Himself. They still haven't understood. But as we look at here after a while in Zechariah, they will look upon Him whom they pierced, and they will wail for Him and weep for Him as, their, uh, as one would weep for their only begotten Son. Uh, uh, God would use the Gentile nations to accomplish uh, this, speaking of us, possibly, of how the, the, the revival, not just speaking to the geographical and the political understanding of Israel, but eventually the spiritual awakening of Israel. God reveals his purpose in saving Israel under the new covenant, and then the final portion deals with the millennial temple, and Life in the kingdom age. And moving on to the book of Haggai. Haggai would be after the uh, uh, would be after the captivity and the and the exile. He'd be part of the, part of the restoration. Introduction would be 520 BC. He's calling God's people back to divine priorities. The rebuilding of the temple. They had rebuilt their homes, but they had left off on building the temple. And 538 B.C., the decree came from Cyrus. 536, again, the altar was uh, was built and, and work on and rebuilding of the temple began. But in 535, it was hindered due to legal uh, uh, suits. But 15 years later, it would resume. In four years, it would be finished. The first uh, divide is God calling them to be aware of the current situation. They gathered. But there wasn't enough. They would eat, but they were never full. Life had crowded out the priority of rebuilding the temple. They had homes built, but God's house laid in ruins. And the second section deals with the response or the people's response. The third section deals with the Lord's response to the people. A promise of blessings. If you'll do this, then my blessings will return. And Zechariah, again, uh, he is a priest and he ministers alongside Haggai and trying to get the people in, uh, motivated to rebuild the temple. Uh, the purpose of the book is that uh, they had, uh, had responded to Haggai's message, but now Zechariah ministered in encouraging the people. Uh, not just that the work would begin, but they would stay after it and keep after it. Uh, this is, begins uh, by giving a short history lesson, uh, lesson, the high price of their father's sins. He also has uh, had night visions, uh, the man standing among the myrtle trees, Israel is placed under Gentile subjection. Uh, the second communicate, uh, communicates the message of Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 again, uh, dealing with those kingdoms. The third deals with the wonderful time when the Messiah will be present. Uh, the fourth deals with God's acceptance of Joshua, the high priest, while Satan stands there accusing him. Uh, remember, he was standing there in, in filthy garments, Satan accusing him. And Jesus Christ has him remove, uh, has uh, or he remo removes his iniquity, his uh, his clothing that was tainted, and he puts upon him his own clothing, his own righteousness. And the fifth vision is that of the candlesticks and the olive trees. Uh, again, when you look at oil, and there's a symbolic, uh, there's something symbolic being portrayed here. This uh, the Holy Spirit is always symbolized. Uh, by the uh, by oil and the olive trees symbolizing that there would be a constant supply there would be these pipes that were hooked in that looked like to these olive trees and it just seems like there was oil constantly being poured this was symbolizing the constant supply of the spirit on Zerubbabel 
The second part of the book contains four messages that deal with questions and events in their at present day. Should the, uh, should the Jews um, continue to fast in the fifth month and the seventh month? And Zechariah tells them you haven't, uh, that they should, uh, they should have mourned over their sin that caused the judgment, not the judgment this, itself. It's just like someone who is, um, who is penitent, but they're penitent that they got caught not for the sin itself, and that's what he's saying is you aren't, you're not sorry over your sin, you're sorry that over the destruction. And the final part, it says he has two burdens. The effect, the first one is the effect of the Gentile uh, world uh, movements on the nation of Israel, especially during the day of the Lord. And the, se- uh, the, the first deals with the first coming of Jesus, the second deals with his second coming. Let's look at our final book. Malachi, last of the prophets. Introduced uh, introduction in this uh, book is that his name means my messenger. He is the last prophet. 430 BC is the time of his ministry. He addresses the corrupt the corrupt priesthood, the intermarriage with the heathen, and the mis- the misuse of the temple and the neglect of offerings. Well, a man rob God is uh, is what he's quoted as. Many preachers will put, quote him for. Uh, he spoke to the priests, he spoke to the leaders, and he spoke to the people who lived in Jerusalem. Considerations. The people had grown spiritually cold and indifferent. And the summary of this book, the first deals with God's declaration of love for Israel. Uh, the next deals with the unfaithful priests and uh, the poor representation to God's people. And they had polluted the sacrifices. They, they were kindling strange fire and uh, total disregard for God's law. Uh, the third dealt with uh, the people who had backslid, uh, who were backsliding. They had divorced their Jewish wives to marry foreigners, and they refused to pay their tithes. They were robbing God of their tithes and their offerings. Israel had lost her fear and reverence for God, and uh, God has called them back to Himself in this. And the final part of this passage deals with. Uh, the prophecy of God sending his messenger before his face, and that was John the Baptist. And he prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah and the spirit of Elijah. And if you recall that final verse, it says that uh, he would he would cause the hearts of the father to return to the children and the hearts of the children to return to their fathers. Um, and with that, we have finished all the prophets, and I want to give you this time, uh, and I'm going to go over this slowly. Uh, We're going to go through the final. If you want to take notes on this, I highly, highly, highly recommend you do, because I have the final right here in front of me, and I'm basically reading you off the answers, along with the questions, okay? So, again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you need to know it word for word, and it says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 The fourteen sons of Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, Asher, Levite, Reuben, Gad, Judah, Simeon, Dan, Naphtali, Zebulun, Benjamin, and Issachar. Uh, Daniel's image, the head of gold, represented the Rome, or the I'm sorry, the Babylonian Empire. The breasts and arms of silver was the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, the thighs of brass was the Grecian Empire. The legs of iron was the Roman Empire. The feet of of iron and clay is the Antichrist Kingdom. And then the uh, rock cut without hands. Uh, it speaks of Jesus' millennial reign. Scripture references to the covenants. Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17 is the Noahic covenant. Abrahamic covenant is Genesis chapter 15. Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. You need to know the Ten Commandments in their order. No other gods before me. No graven images, number two. Number three is take his name in vain. Four is honor the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Fifth is honor your father and mother. Six is thou shalt not kill. Seven is thou shalt not steal. Eight is thou shalt not commit adultery. Nine is thou shalt not 
bear false witness or lie. And ten is thou shalt not covet. Uh, describe the beast of, of Daniel. So this is the last part of your quiz or your final. You, this is again more of an essay or not an essay but a description. You're going to have to write out as much of this as you can remember. And the Babylonian kingdom, he was a lion with the with the eagle's wings that, and these eagle wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon hit the feet as a man. A man's heart was given to it. And in the representation of the Medo-Persian Empire, it was likened to a bear that raised up on its one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth, uh, between the teeth of it, and uh, and they and they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. That's Daniel chapter seven, verse five. Uh, represent. Uh, There's also representation of the Grecian Empire. It was likened to a leopard that had uh, on its back four wings like a fowl. The beast uh, had also four heads. Dominion was given unto it. And the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, which also pictures the, uh, has, a, has some semblance to the Antichrist Empire. And the reason you know that is because it has a little bit of the iron to it. The fourth beast was dreadful. Terrible. Ex uh, strong exceedingly. Had great iron teeth. It devoured and it broke into pieces. It stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. That's Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. And you also have two bonus questions, uh, but I'm not going to give you those. They're bonus for a reason. Uh, I gave you one a few weeks ago, if you remember it, and that's the only one you're going to get from me. With that, guys, it's been a pleasure having gone through the whole Old Testament with you. Uh, I wish we could have stopped and, and gone down a few bunny trails and and uh, and examined some um, wonderful passages of scripture, uh, but because this is a survey, we got to cover a whole bunch of uh, real estate as far as scripture is concerned in such a limited amount of time. With that, I pray God's blessings upon you. I I, I pray that you just do your best uh, for your final, and it, regardless of your score, of uh, whatever happens here. I pray that you walk away with a knowledge of the Lord that can be tucked away into your heart, that the Holy Spirit can bring back and, and, and cause you to understand His faithfulness. Uh, and He is a covenant-keeping God. Uh, he promised the seed of the woman from the very foundation of the world, and we see that fulfillment in the New Testament. And uh, I pray that if you don't know the Lord Jesus, that in going through the Old Testament, you see that he was foreshadowed that he would come some 4,000 years before he would ever be on the scene. And uh, he is, if you read the Old Testament, he is the fulfillment of every picture of, the, of, of what the Messiah was, was supposed to be. And down to the very letter of prophecy in which was describing of him. And so uh, he is the son that was sent. Because God so loved us, and that he died for us, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe that's true? If you do, all you need to do is whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the God, the covenant-keeping God, who cannot lie, has promised to you, if you'll believe on him, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so with that, I pray that you'd be saved if you're lost. And if you're saved, I pray that you are challenged to walk uh, all the more closer to Him. And with that, I bid you Godspeed.